Okay. I have Sean Hoffman here, and this is uh, Cindy Johnson, and she, he's going to go ahead and start out. Hi, my name is Sean Hoffman. I'm here with Cindy Johnson and two representatives from the Food Safety and Lodging Division of the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Adam Inman and Autumn Shook. <laughs> Welcome to the A Culture of Food Safety Frequent Food Safety Violations webinar. This webinar counts as one hour of professional development for professional standards and will cover frequent food safety violations in Kansas school nutrition programs in a question and answer format. There are many important questions to ask when working to create a culture of food safety in the school nutrition program environment. How safe are the food safety practices in the nutrition program? Is there an understanding of the risks associated with handling time and temperature control for safety foods for a vulnerable population? Is enough information on food safety shared with all team members? Are the right resources available? So in the real world application of food safety, so sometimes people do what is simple and not what is right. Um, so factors that can influence the decision to handle food safely and to practice those good personal hygiene practices include competence, perceptions, availability of resources, facility design and layout, and support from key organizations and agencies. And knowledge really helps team members become more confident in how to manage their food safety risks. The awareness of the science of food safety can help change those perceptions and, and maybe those behaviors. The availability of resources promotes compliance by ensuring there are enough supplies, equipment, time, and staff to get the job done. Facility design and physical layout of the facility have roles in encouraging or discouraging those food safe behaviors because sometimes the design and placement of equipment will determine whether or not that piece of equipment will get cleaned properly. And then key organizations and agencies are, provide the tools to support and promote food safety efforts within the program. So a culture of food safety happens when food safety or food safe food handling becomes a priority and part of the day-to-day -day practices of people who work in the school nutrition program. Um, team members in the program identify with the statement, this is who we are and this is what we do all the time and every time to keep the food safe, to stay healthy uh, and just be safe in general. So for example, to promote a culture of hand washing in the program environment, you really need to include all the factors that could motivate that hand washing compliance. So to promote competency, you would educate on the proper protocol for washing hands. To change perceptions and create an understanding of the consequences for not washing hands, you would provide the why and, and those reinforcements to so that you can communicate that hand washing is a priority in the program. Ensure there are enough fully stocked hand sinks accessible to all team members. That's another great way to get compliance with hand washing. And access some hand washing resources such as signs and posters, handouts, videos, and training from reputable organizations and agencies. Can you advance <laughs> Um, creating and maintaining a culture of food safety in the school nutrition program environment requires time and ongoing effort until those safe practices really become part of that routine. So by the end of the webinar, attendees will become more familiar or more aware of the violations that occur in school nutrition programs, learn what corrective actions to take to be in compliance, be reminded of the HACCP record keeping requirements, and learn where to find those resources that help support a culture of food safety. Um, part of developing a culture of food safety in, in the nutrition program is evaluating, well, what went wrong in the past in the food handling process and what can be done to prevent that deviation from occurring again. So common food violations cited by the Kansas Department of Agriculture Inspections in Kansas involved whether or not 
Food contact surfaces were kept clean and sanitized. Food contact surfaces were properly designed, easily cleanable, and in good condition. Utensils, equipment, and linens were properly stored, dried, and handled. Non-food contact surfaces were kept clean. Physical facilities were properly installed, maintained, and cleaned. Plumbing was installed to include proper backflow devices. Time and temperature control for safety, cold foods were kept at the proper cold temperatures. Proper date marking of time and temperature control for safety foods occurred. Insects, rodents, and animals were not present in the facility, and toxic substances were properly identified, stored, and used. And, and many of these inspection violations were corrected on site with the assistance of the inspector, but some of these violations really required a change in habits or maybe a change in facility improvements. So to help Kansas school nutrition programs make further improvements in their food safety practices today, joining us are Adam and Autumn, who are going to answer some food safety questions and share some of their insights on some of these inspection and violations that occurred in schools. So welcome Adam and Autumn, and thank you for joining us today. So we're gonna review some of the food safety violations listed in more detail. And then I'm going to allow um, some response from you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. If, if you have just come onto the conference call, could you please uh, push star six to mute your line, please? And that'll allow so no background noise. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So, cleaning and maintaining food contact services are critical food safety practices and work to protect the program from contamination and all the food in the program. And, and it includes things like your preparation statement, your drawers, your dishware, utensils, ice machines, mixer parts, um, openers, knives, knife racks, slicers, pots, pans, and storage bins. So Adam and Autumn, what are some of the reasons for the violations regarding cleaning and maintaining food contact surfaces in school nutrition programs? Right, so of course, in order to keep these items cleanable, that, that they are in a condition that's clean and sanitized and that they're not contaminating food, they have to, um, have to be smooth enough to be able to, to be cleaned so that uh, then the sanitizer can, can finish off the job. So if you've got cracks and crevices or rough edges, uh, I know those rubber, rubber spatulas tend to break a lot and get those cracks in there. That can actually trap food particles. Bacteria can establish themselves in those crevices, and then that would just contaminate all the food items that that, that utensil touches. So that's why it's so important to have those properly constructed to start with and then maintained and, and eventually replaced as their life cycle wears out. Okay, it's a common practice to keep those food contact surfaces in the facility cleaned, but what about those non-food contact surfaces such as walls, floors, fans, coolers, racks? Is the phone go out? Okay, so we need to, to yeah, we need to activate the phone line again. I think it went out. Do you need that number again? Okay, we're just going to take a minute to activate the phone line again. Sure. Boy, that little thumb. Yeah, wow. It's pretty sensitive. Yeah. Generator code. call. Please enter your conference code, followed by the pound or hand sign. Technology knows when you need it. Yeah. Thank you. If you are the leader, so will we lose all these people, or will they still be on? Please enter your leader pin, followed by the pound or hand sign. One zero oh, three six five. Sean Hoffman. Thank you. To start or join your conference, press 1. To change the default conference options, press 2. You will now be placed in the conference. 
To mute your line, press star six. To unmute, press pound six. After joining the call, to record the conference for those who may miss this call, or for future playback, press star two. Are, are people still on the conference call there? We apologize there. Uh, there was an issue with the phone where it was hung up. Um, if you can hear me on the conference line, can you please let me know? Okay, thanks. We just bumped the table and it made the phone go out. Right. All right. Thank you. Oh, okay. no, I'm glad you didn't. Thank you so much. And if uh, need be, please uh, star six again. I apologize. Uh, we will uh, okay. try not to let anything happen uh, touch the table. We can't so. move. Okay, I need you to click back on my slide. <laughs> See, we have problems with technology, too, so um, it's tough. Okay, so we talked about those food contact surfaces. Um, let's talk a little bit about non-food contact surfaces, such as walls and floors, fans and cooler condensers and racks. Um, Adam and Autumn, why is it so important to keep non-food contact surfaces in the facility clean? Right, so, you know, we... we it's obvious to most people, I think, why the food contact surfaces need to be clean and sanitized so they don't directly contaminate things. But what maybe not so obvious is, is parts of the facility and equipment that may not directly contact food all the time, but they could be disturbed and things could fall into food or bacteria could establish in one part of that equipment or on that surface and either drip or splash into food or even, um, you know, just kind of get stirred up with the next cleaning or sprayed around and, and contaminate food or food contact surfaces. So it's important to start with that clean envelope to, to make sure that the food is safe. I know sometimes if I go into an establishment and I see the ceilings even dripping like dirty fuzzy balls or ventilation systems aren't clean and I know about it, it's like I don't know if I want to continue being there anymore. So people do pay attention to these things and as a customer, you know, we want to, I mean, as we want to make sure we're taking care of our customers by keeping our non-food contact surfaces clean, too. So thank you. Um, so a common but unexpected violation has to do with those physical facilities, um, making sure they're properly installed, maintained, kept clean as part of the core requirements of the Kansas Food Code. So Adam and Autumn, what are some examples of common violations involving the physical facilities in a school nutrition program. What are you seeing out there that gets cited quite a lot? Yeah, so this is a pretty broad umbrella as far as classifying violations. So this ranges from the placement of hand sinks that making sure that their hand sinks adequate um, in the in the food prep areas where they're needed, but then also that those hand sinks will provide hand washing uh, appropriate level of uh, hot water for hand washing. Um, could be ceiling tiles that maybe could be water damaged and they could flake or drip into food or food contact surfaces. Unshielded light bulbs. I was actually at a buffet restaurant once as an inspector and had a fluorescent bulb exploded. And fortunately it was enclosed. It was in one of those shielding tubes and it sounded like a shotgun going off. And wow. That tube saved a lot of food from having to be disposed of because it contained everything. But then it's also, this umbrella covers floor damage. So that can be pooling water, which again can lead to listeria, bacteria establishing itself and containing food. Gaps in uh, entry doors would allow pests to enter and then toilet rooms being properly supplied. So it's a, it's a, a broad spectrum. It sure is. Excuse yeah. me, Adam. Uh, on the conference call, if uh, you have not pushed star six to mute your line, could you do that, please? Okay, so Adam and Autumn, when an inspector cites a backflow issue in a facility, what exactly is the problem with backflow issues? And, and some of these pictures on the slide aren't showing how they're supposed to, but maybe Adam and Autumn, you could explain a little bit about some backflow issues that you have seen in school nutrition programs. Right, so a typical, probably the most common one, I'd say a little background if, if, you, if you're not familiar. Uh, backflow is water that's not clean getting drawn into the, the water supply system you know, through any kind of point of connection that, that can happen. 
The one we see most typically, I think, in schools is with chemical dispensers that are installed. You know, a lot of, a lot of schools, kitchens have been around a while, and maybe haven't been able to be updated for a while, and so they'll want to update to the latest chemical dispenser, and so they'll tap into the most convenient and the quickest water supply, which is oftentimes the, the mop sink faucet. And that requires, you know, what you've done there is you change that that installation to something it wasn't originally designed to do. There's a typically a backflow prevention device called an atmospheric vacuum breaker installed on those faucets. And when you put a shutoff valve downstream, that can cause some issues with that device. And so there's a lot of configurations, but usually we see a Y valve put on the end, and one side of the Y goes to the chemical dispenser. From our standpoint, the chemical dispenser is not typically a concern because it has integrated backflow protection. But that other end of the Y then comes off to a hose oftentimes. And so that atmospheric vacuum breaker is still expected and needed to protect the water supply, but it's not up to that task of having shutoff valves downstream from it. So we try to work with folks to find the, the most effective and cost-effective solution to those problems. But the long story of that is that the short answer is that we just want to make sure that everything's installed so we don't have chemicals or sewage getting drawn back into the clean water supply. Yeah, because we did talk, I mean, we have talked to them about dirty water coming back up into the clean water supply, but chemicals, you're right, is another big deal, and that could make people very sick. Yeah, another another one that we see, not so much in schools, but maybe it happens. I know from the school nutrition side, you guys love the soda fountain machines that may still be out there in some of the schools, but having those properly protected from backflow is also important to prevent copper poisoning. So that's another one we see occasionally in a school. Huh. Well, I hope they don't have soda machines, but I have seen like cappuccino machines and things like that. So I think that would be along the same lines as it is, is not having backflow problems from running into your morning cappuccino. It could be. It could be. Typically, those don't have a carbonated water supply, so okay. you don't see that leaching copper into the into them. Then, and a lot of times they're it's their powder, so they're they're usually pretty pretty. Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they just get all clogged up. Yep. I, okay. I see the picture there that I should mention too. Sorry. Oh, um, yeah, the air gap. The yeah. springer nozzles. You know those yeah. springs wear out a lot. So what we tell folks is, is uh, first thing, flip that spring over. If your maintenance guy can un unattach it and flip that spring over, a lot of times that'll give you some more life out of it and get that that outlet above the flood rim. Um, but if not, then you might need to get a new spring or come up with another solution. And then we also see food prep sinks that have direct drain connections to the sewer. And Sometimes people are shocked when we say it, but we'd rather have the sewer back up on the floor so you can know it and, and address it appropriately <laughs> rather than backing into the sink where you might not notice it and it could cause contamination of food products. Well, thanks for the tip on turning the spring over. I didn't know that you could do that, and that will lengthen the life a little bit. Um, I know those sprayer nozzles really get handled quite a lot and probably not gently either. Yeah, a lot of work going on. <laughs> okay, it's sometimes hard to hold those um, time and temperature control for safety cold foods at the proper cold temperatures on the food bars. So, and that includes things of animal origin, such as your dairy products, eggs, deli meat, plant foods, such as cut melons, cut leafy greens, and cut tomatoes, and altered products, such as a school-made ranch dressing or a school-made salsa or anything along those lines. So what are some recommendations for holding foods cold on the food bar in a school nutrition program? So this is Autumn speaking. Um, Hi, it's Autumn. been a while since I've done an inspection in a school, but ice is a common way to um, keep foods cold. You just have to be careful that the ice isn't introduced into the product. But if it is, we hope that that ice is um, made from safe drinking water anyway. So if it were to be introduced, it wouldn't contaminate the food necessarily, just water it down some. Um, I don't know if people are using ice blankets or ice pillows, but um, that is an, an additional option. Um, obviously, a, a well-maintained refrigerator um, that can keep the food at 41 degrees or lower is the best option. 
Um, and if that's not possible, there is an allowance for using time as a public health control um, rather than the temperature itself. So um, it, it creates a little bit more work, but um, and potentially product loss, um, having to discard product at the end of the serving period, but it is an option if the others are not available. Yeah, I have seen time as a public health control used a lot for those cut leafy greens and cut tomatoes um, on the food bar, and I think that's a good plan for some of those items that are really hard to hold cold anyway. And I have seen people um, put like the ice in a bigger pan and then put the product in a smaller pan on top of that ice. So again, so that ice doesn't have a way to get in contact with the actual food product or have some sort of drainage system in place. Um, so the again, the melted water doesn't kind of get in contact with that food. Yeah, one thing that I think sometimes people um, have this sense of um, security that while the ice is touching the bottom of the container, surely it's going to keep this entire huge bowl of yeah. food cold. <laughs> but it doesn't unless the ice is actually surrounding the product or at least the container that it's holding it. So, you know, a tiny little exposure surface area of the container being exposed to the ice isn't going to keep the entire um, container of food cold. So yeah. it needs to be surrounded by the ice if you're going to be utilizing that as the medium to keep it cold, so. Yeah. Thank you. So um, date marking is another requirement for time and temperature control for safety foods, and some foods require date marking and others do not. Um, I know the Kansas Food Code requires date marking for all time and temperature control for safety foods prepared on site that are cold and stored in the refrigerator, such as leftovers. Um, also required for refrigerated commercially prepared time and temperature control for safety foods after they've been opened, for example, a cottage cheese, and any food that has a, uh, been altered in some way and has a time and temperature control for safety ingredient added to it. And one of the things I remember from, from when I was a director is that my employees would always add liquid milk to a commercial ranch dressing so that it would pump through the pumps a lot easier. And in my mind, that was a an altered product that needed to be refrigerated at that time. So Adam and Autumn, how long can a time and temperature control for safety food be saved? So yeah, so seven days is what the food code allows. So that that's the date of preparation or the date of opening on the product. And as you mentioned, those those ranch dressings, even the ones where they, they may still be making it from scratch or taking a mix and adding the components. The individual components might not require temperature control for safety, but you put them together, you change the water activity, the amount of moisture that's available for bacteria, and now they, they do. So uh, seven days is what's required. The good news is this is you know, a, an important requirement, but a lot of these that we've covered so far are lower on the risk spectrum, still important, but a little bit lower. So that's good news that these are some of the, we're cleaning up some of the loose ends on, on these violations. So for date marking, having that system that you know when a food was opened and when it needs to be discarded, that's what we're looking for. And there's a lot of flexibility in how you accomplish that, but just making sure that it doesn't stick around too long so that we don't have listeria bacteria growing, which can grow at refrigeration temperatures. And, and a local sponsor has the option of, of being less than seven days. I know some sponsors, I've heard four days, three days, five days, as long as it's under that seven-day requirement in the food code. Sure, I, and sure. me, personally, at home, I go with a three-day rule, so I really want to be safe. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, and I should also mention that if you need to extend that and keep some of that around, a little longer, you can put it in the freezer. And the time that's frozen doesn't count, but the day it goes into the freezer counts as a day, and the day it comes out of the freezer counts as a day. And so you have to do a little bit of extra math when you're when you're doing that kind of date marking, and it involves a freezer. Yeah, because time stops in the freezer and then comes starts again when it's out of the freezer. So thank you for remembering that. Okay, rodents and other pests can keep um, can creep through very small openings and they can climb run jump and some can even fly which means they're able to go just about anywhere 
So Adam and Autumn, how can a facility possibly control these pesky pests? Sure, it's a, definitely an ongoing battle. And we see sometimes a, it's even a bigger hill to climb with older facilities and maybe have more openings and more maintenance opportunities. Maybe a location near a, an open field, maybe uh, a lot of things going against us. But the key point that I look at is try to seal that outer opening as much as you can. And maybe even it has to be a last line of defense around the kitchen and the cafeteria if you can't get the whole building sealed up. But then also working with your pest control operators to use integrated pest control methods, including exclusion of pests, uh, inspecting incoming shipments for pests that may be hitching a ride, like roaches. Yeah. Like roaches. And then, of course, the main thing is keeping a, that clean facility, which goes back to what we talked about earlier, is if the pests get there and there's nothing for them to live on, just like you and me, they love to have water shelter. If they don't find that in the facility, they're not going to last long, and your pest control met other pest control methods are going to be more effective. So inspecting for evidence of pests in the facility, cleaning up when they're found, but logging that so you can work with your pest control operator to find the most effective means. And then inspecting food products to make sure that they haven't been chewed on or in, impacted by those pests. Yeah, I have, um, when I was a director, I did notice that when I, I had mouse, uh, mice in my facility, it was because there was construction nearby and I had to be even more diligent. And when they got into the storeroom, they just didn't try one box of cereal. They had to try all the boxes of cereal, which required throwing everything away in the facility. So it can be very costly. Yeah, and they have one other fun thing about mice is they have weak bladders, I guess, and they, they yearn because uh, yeah. they run along. So they leave a trail of urine along with the droppings. And they'll go anywhere. That's what just amazes me. I've seen one climb up a, like a kitchen island, just climb up the side. And I always wondered how they would get on the countertops. But that's totally how. They just climb right up the side. And, and yeah, they'll go in a walk-in cooler. I've seen them in, in that in there. So they'll go anywhere. They survive. They survive the, I guess they could survive 41. Um, yeah, they go in and out somehow. <laughs> Lovely, right. But I actually, to me, uh, you know, rodent, the rodents are bad, but I think flies, because I know what flies do now. I, I was better off before I knew what flies did when they land on food, and now that I know it, I just get freaked out when I see a fly. That's so. a great point. That's a great point, too, because flies are a challenge, especially certain times of the year. And so, again, that exclusion... And working with the pest controller, you might need to use um, the, the bait lights, not the zappers, because those will throw blood <laughs> parts everywhere. But the right, and not the fly paper either. Fly paper can work; it's effective. Really? You just have to put it. Yeah, you just have to put it in the right location okay. where it's not over food. So hanging them over a trash can, for example, is a, can be effective because you don't walk, okay. you won't accidentally walk into it. And if it drips yeah. down some goo, it's going to drip in the trash can. Um, and then even some, some food grade mineral oil in a spray bottle could be used to do knockdown if you have heavy fly pressure. So there's, again, tips and tricks you can work with your pest control operator to address those. And, and sanitation is the foundation for, for pest control also. Right. Thank you. <laughs> those are tips that we can use at our picnic, right? Yeah. So um, let's say an inspector went to ABC middle or ABC school district and identified opportunities for improvement. So for example, ABC elementary was cited for not properly identifying the soap water in one bucket and the sanitizing solution in another bucket during the cleaning process. And then ABC high school was cited for having a labeled spray bottle of sanitizer solution sitting on the counter. And ABC middle school was cited for storing laundry soap on the same shelf as their clean dish racks. So Adam and Autumn, what are the rules for labeling and storing chemicals? Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically it's, it's the, the goal is to make sure that everybody knows what's in a container so we don't use it for the wrong purpose. You know, you can it be everything from wiping down a, a, a food contact surface with the wrong product to maybe mixing some chemicals that shouldn't be mixed. So just it's a basic safety and sanitation and, and industrial hygiene pra practice, but then it has application of food safety to make sure that we don't end up um, getting chemicals into food 
pre predominantly that's the main point of it. So just labeling it. Now, a good thing about soap is it will clean stuff up. The bad thing is it will clean off the marker that you wrote on the bucket. So just mm -hmm. part of the habit of checking it and making sure to relabel it when that wears off is, is um, important. And then storing chemicals appropriately, too. So if you're in use, you grab that sanitizer bottle, put it back where it belongs, or put it onto another surface that's not a food contact surface and won't drip down into, into food or clean utensils. OK, thank you. Just another reminder on the conference call, if you have just joined um, and you have not pressed star six, please press star six to mute your line. Thank you. Okay, well, the top violations were those that were cited most frequently. There are some other less well-known violations that required attentions in our school nutrition programs. And since all of the codes um, that are in the Kansas Food Code are critical to maintaining health and safety, let's talk about some of the less cited violations that occurred in school nutrition programs. So wet wiping cloths was one. Wet wiping cloths held between uses must be in a sanitizing solution at the appropriate concentration. Um, how long does that sanitizing solution stay active? And what is this binding that I heard a little bit about one time? Yeah, okay, so, you know, the bacteria will tend to grow if you give them enough time. So that's why you need to manage the time on these wiping cloths and or keep them in in the appropriate types of solutions. So the sanitizer will last as long as um, it lasts. The only way to know for sure is to check it with your test strips. So we recommend doing that. It's inexpensive and you can and be confident in its, its level. Also, if you have food particles that build up there, you need to change that solution out because that's gonna bind up your sanitizer and it's not gonna be available for, for taking care of the bacteria and viruses. Uh, quant binding is an interesting phenomenon. We haven't heard too much about it lately, so hopefully the industry is getting a handle on it. But there's there's uh, some some science there that that the certain types of, of wiping cloths will actually bind up the quaternary ammonium compounds, and so they won't be available to work on bacteria. So if you're using a quat, there's uh, really long names on the chemical labels of what the active ingredients. And there's usually ammonia stuck in there somewhere, or quaternary. And you need to talk to your chemical supplier and make sure that, that there's no concerns there with the type of wiping cloth that you're using. And if there is, that you're able to get the, either a different chemical or to get a cloth that's not going to have that concern. Okay, thank you. So another less well-known violation that surfaced several times over the course of the last few years had to do with used by labels not being completely removed from the outside surface of a wash storage container. Uh, and what's not showing up on this slide is a picture of a storage container with a label on it that um, is not quite removed all the way. So what, what is the problem with a bit of label stuck to a clean container? Why do programs need to have due diligence in getting those labels off? Those leftover labels will, well, they're sticky naturally, and they will be a source of contamination for the future food that you're going to put in there. Um, it's not considered clean if it still resides. So I know they can be, and there's been lots of different brands out there and things that people have tried to buy to ones that will dissolve or, or whatnot, mm -hmm. but maybe just a little bit of elbow grease will do a container good rather than just simply putting it through a dishwasher. You might have to scrub a little bit, but you want to remove that so, so that way the next food item that you put in there won't be contaminated on what's left behind. Yeah, that's the tricky part is it's got to stick long enough to make it through the yes. date marking in the walk-in cooler, but <laughs> not so long that you have a hard time getting it getting that off. Now, one thing we've heard recently from some restaurant operators is a good quality painter's tape, masking tape, ah. is a good solution for them because it sticks well even in the cooler or slightly damp condition, but it peels right off. And it's not the cheap tape, but the, let's see, the, the quality uh, masking tape brands. And it'll last yeah. through for your seven days in the cooler, but just peel right off with, without too much trouble. 
So the, I'm thinking of the brands that I've seen, and they're green and blue painters tape. Those kind of tape is that the kind of tape that you're meaning? Yeah, and you might okay. you might experiment um, with it to see, but a lot of those will will maybe do a little bit better. Grease pencil can be a good alternative, but it if you go too heavy on it, it might leave some residue as well that's tough to get off of okay. the container. Well, I like the idea of the painter's tape. I think that's a great idea. We'll give it a try. Okay, some schools had violations involving food ingredients that were transferred from one container to another container and not labeled. So what are some examples of uh, what you've seen out there when a school site removes something from one container to another and they don't label it. How can programs safely transfer food ingredients into working containers? Yeah, well, for the most part, you know, you can tell what things are, but unfortunately <laughs> there are times when you might have a, an abrasive powder that looks a lot like flour or looks like even sugar. So. That's why it's really important that whatever container you have it in, that it's a food grade container for your food products and it's appropriately labeled with the contents so that you don't accidentally grab the wrong thing. Most of the time, if it was sugar for salt, you just have a horrible product, mm -hmm. but we just need to guard against that and get in those, those good habits of making sure that they're properly labeled. And then there's some other liquids that you really just can't tell anymore. And then we start getting into degreasers and soaps versus flavorings, that, that could be a real problem as well. So just make sure that everything is appropriately labeled and accurately labeled. I do have an example of the white powders. When I was in college, I helped with catering and we did a coffee service and someone had accidentally put the salt into the sugar bowls, mm -hmm. which ruined our coffee service with the wonderful dessert that we had served. So it is something that's easy to do when you're in a hurry, if things aren't labeled properly to use the wrong product. Okay, so a Kansas food safety violation that caught some school sites off guard had to do with labeling of foods packaged on site and offered in the nutrition program. So when must foods that are packaged on site be labeled? So, in order to give consumers the information that they want and need to make informed decisions, you have to have some labeling information available. Now, there's a, it's kind of a gray area, so we just drew a bright line and we said that if it's being handed to the person, if it's not available for self-service, then even though it may be wrapped or, or packaged, it doesn't have to have the labeling information. If it's offered for self-service and it's not like an apple or something that's single ingredient and obvious what it is in the way it's presented, then you need to have some way to communicate that information to the person. So that could be labeling it with the, with the required elements, or it could be placing a, a sign or a placard or a table tent that says that labeling information is available upon request. And of course that labeling information needs to be accurate, however it's presented. Yeah, and I have seen like some sites, if they had a wrapped cookie for sale, they would put the copy of the recipe out there as a way to communicate what the ingredients are. So they could use the recipe, they could use um, a placard that says uh, ingredients available upon request, or they could actually put an actual label on the product. Yeah. Of course, food allergens are, are very important. and. Although we might think that someone with a food allergy would readily identify themselves, there are some social pressures sometimes that, that kids may not want to identify and stand out. So they may not ask that question. So it's good to have that information available uh, to help protect them. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the Kansas Department of Agriculture establishes uh, some food safety regulations that are communicated by way of the food code and some of the requirements in there are categorized in three areas of importance. Priority items, priority foundation items, and core items. So what do these uh, Kansas food terms mean? Right, so these are based on the national food code and these were the terms that nationally were, were agreed upon is the best way to divide into three levels of priority these violations. So 
any term, so we went through this, any term that you come up with, you're going to have to explain something. So we thought we'd just go with the national model and use these terms. So priority items indicated by a P, and in our inspection reports, they're all grouped in their three categories separately. So you can kind of go from top to bottom, from most important to not as important, but still important. I think that's really helpful. Yeah, good. We, we hope that that helps folks kind of give it in a list, but then break it out into the, into the levels as well. But those priority items are most directly linked to causing a foodborne illness. So if you don't control those items, they will cause an illness if things line up right. Priority foundation items are things that help support priority items. They may not in the, of themselves cause an illness, but if they're not controlled, they can facilitate priority items occurring. And then core items are sort of those basic things that are necessary to, to have a safe operation. And that covers a lot of, fortunately, a lot of these violations we've been talking about so far fall into that core item, which means that we've got the, the really big stuff under control and we're just we're picking up the, the details, the last few details. Um, examples of each of these. A priority item would be cooking a raw animal food to the appropriate temperature, cooling down a leftover that requires time and temperature control for safety, cooling that down appropriately to the time and temperature that's as required. Uh, and then a priority foundation item would, for those examples would be to have a, an accurate thermometer that's suitable for taking those temperatures to confirm that you've reached those temperatures. Those would be uh, priority would be the cooking, priority foundation would be having a, a thermometer. Another example of priority would be sanitizing your utensils after cleaning and that would be a priority. Have a test kit to confirm your sanitizer concentration would be a priority foundation item. So that, that really does help explain the difference between those two, so thank you. And then a core item would just be like the equipment be in place and things like that? Yeah, and non-food contact surfaces, uh, general uh, facilities, sanitation. general sanitation, a lot of that falls under the, the core items. Equipment design elements, all kinds of stuff. It gets down into some really specific um, details. So record keeping of uh, food safe practices is a HACCP requirement, HACCP standing for hazard analysis critical control point, and that is a preventative system that's in place to hopefully lower our risks in our facility so that we can prevent the food from becoming contaminated. Um, to be in compliance with HACCP protocol, records must be kept on certain activities, and, and we have noticed uh, when, when the inspectors go out and when we go out that record keeping has become a bit of a shortfall in some establishments. They, you know, haven't been keeping it up on an ongoing basis. So records are checked uh, by both KDA inspectors when they come out for their twice a year inspections and by KSDE consultants when they come out and do reviews. And those HACCP records must be kept for at least two years. Now some record keeping is optional and some is required. So a required one is the temperatures of the foods that you receive from a delivery, whether that delivery is coming from a truck or the delivery is coming from a main kitchen to a satellite kitchen. So a temperature of a sampling of those cold high risk foods from a delivery must be recorded when they are received. So if that delivery occurs before the nutrition program staff arrive to work, like for example, milk deliveries sometimes arrive before uh, people get there, then uh, make sure there is protocol in place to keep that food safe. You know, for example, that milk delivery would need to have a way to be put in cold storage when it's delivered. And then personnel might check it first thing in the morning to make sure it is the correct temperature. Cold storage unit temperatures. The, deliver, the temperatures of all cold storage units must be retaken and, and recorded each business day. And those refrigerators have to be cold enough to keep the food inside at 41 or below. So sometimes they need to be set at 38 so that you allow a little recovery time. Freezers must be cold enough to keep that food in a frozen state. Now, as far as dry storage room temperatures, that's not required. That would be a best practice. Uh, if you are using your dry products on a first-in, first-out basis and using them within a reasonable time, 
then the temperature of the dry storeroom is not going to be a major concern. It is also not required to take and record the temperature of your dish machine every day, although it is a best practice. Uh, it is recommended that staff monitor the temperature gauges on a hot water sanitizing machine and test that temperature to the plate inside the machine periodically. When the inspector comes out, they will send a temperature reading device through that machine to make sure that the um, sanitizing water is hitting the plate at the correct temperature. And it's going to be unique to your machine generally, but if you have a hot water sanitizing dish machine that the outside gauge is supposed to be at 180, it must hit the plate to 160 on the inside of the machine. Um, thermometer calibration is required as part of our HACCP uh, food safety plans. Thermometers that are used to take the internal temperatures of foods must be checked and calibrated to 32 degrees every two weeks using the ice bath method. And it is required that you keep records to show proof that this thermometer calibration occurred for both bimetallic stem thermometers and digital thermometers. Um, record keeping is also required when a large quantity of food is being discarded because it's unfit in some way. So for example, if a product's been recalled, then record the incident. If your freezer went down and you lost a lot of product, then uh, record that incident and keep a tally of all the food that was lost in that um, equipment malfunction. The monthly food safety checklist is required. It must be completed through visual observance. This is the, like the two-page checklist that you go out to make sure uh, the program is following good food safe protocol on a daily basis. And it's not a checklist that you would complete at your desk. It's through, it's through physical observation and looking at record keeping to making sure to make sure that all of the um, protocol is being followed. The um, checklist for annual review is an, an annual review of your HACCP plan. It's a worksheet that you would get off of our website to just show that you evaluated your HACCP plan. You went through your standard operating procedures to make sure they still match what you do in your operation because what's in writing must match what you actually do and all comply with the Kansas Food Code. Food safety training completed is something that's required. So when you have a staff member that takes approved food safety training, you would want to update that training log in KenClaim so that you don't get a computer generated announcement saying they are past due. Uh, cooling procedures, it is required to establish cooling procedures in your facility for the different types of food, like a thin food like soup, a thick food like chili, and a textured food like um, chicken nuggets or something like that. So once you have these standards tested and documented, then those standards that have been proven effective must be followed from then on in that establishment. So each establishment will um, figure out what their own standards are going to be for cooling foods to the proper temperatures within the required time. So you don't have to keep records each time something's cooled just to establish your procedures for cooling the three types of food on an ongoing basis. State and federal organizations and agencies work hard to ensure child nutrition program staff are equipped to do the best job possible. They provide resource support, professional development opportunities, and oversight to school nutrition programs. There are several supporting agencies and organizations that can help sites promote a culture of food safety in the program environment. The Kansas State Department of Education, the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the Institute of Child Nutrition, the Center for Food Safety and Child Nutrition Programs, the United States Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the School Nutrition Association all provide food safety resources and support. Adam and Autumn, what activities fall under the responsibility of the Food Safety and Lodging Division of the Kansas Department of Agriculture? All right, so um, we are tasked, we're responsible for 
doing food safety inspections at food establishments, including schools. And as you all are probably aware, we are required to do two food safety, routine food safety inspections at each school site each year. So um, that's our baseline task that we're tasked with. What we we like to do is we, I say this a lot, but we our inspectors typically enjoy going out and doing the school inspections because it's, everybody's on board with providing good, safe, nutritious food for the kids. And so having partners in that objective is, is wonderful and it's oftentimes a good break from sometimes, you know, in, in business maybe things are a little bit different than they are in school. So our folks like to get out into the schools. But we, we, we're responsible for enforcing those baseline food safety regulations in the schools, but we like to do that in a way that is collaborative and working with the operators, working with the school nutrition programs to, to make that happen. So we like to provide a lot of educational materials and resources. We like to help you out if you have questions on uh, how do I cool this food better? How do, what's the best thing to do this? We like to provide those types of solutions as well, work with you to find the things that will work for your programs. What can a school nutrition program site expect during an inspection? Well, hopefully the majority of the people on this call have already been through an inspection. They're not brand new. Um, I think that we hope that our inspectors are, that are visiting the schools are viewed as a partner. They're there to see the things that maybe you haven't seen because you're so close to it. Um, we're an extra set of eyes. Um, we know that the the staff serving the children would never want to harm them. So we're really on the same page like Adam had said. Um, so I think that using our inspectors as a resource, they're, they're individuals that have access to the code, they have access to research, they have access to um, basically all kinds of different situations that they've seen. And, and we can help provide solutions and ideas, ways to change things um, uh, without hopefully incurring too much cost. It's not our goal to be burdensome because we um, believe in food safety just like you believe in food safety. It is nice that we all really want to protect our customers and we have a true heart for wanting to do that all the time and every time. So usually when there's a shortfall, it's just because people got busy and things like that. So I, I do appreciate that the inspector is a partner and an educator um, and want to continue in that relationship. So you know, we'll work to continue having sponsors see that in the inspectors and, and um, maybe they can ha have more of a partnership than a fear relationship, which is sometimes happens. Yeah, get their business card. Call them when you have a question. Don't wait for your next inspection. There was nothing, nothing brought me greater joy than to have someone call me when just on a whim because they had a question. I mean, to me, that shows that they're thinking about food safety all the time. Some people would say, well, I was afraid if I called you, you'd come out. <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, I, if you're calling me, you're going to be the last person I'm worried about. So um, I think that our inspectors want to see correction. They want to see that you're engaged in making change because there's nothing worse than inspector pointing out something and then someone not doing anything about it. It just makes you, um, you know, somewhat fearful that nothing will change um, after we've um, pointed out some deficiencies that we felt we feel could be changed. And so. Correction on site is really important. We always give people an ample opportunity to, to make the long-term correction. So I think that's important for everyone to understand. So that's all we really want. We, we even have, it happened to me, we hear it all the time still, is we'll actually have personnel say, hey, can you write this down or can you help me make this change or I need you to write this down so we can get the administration, you know, not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but that we can make this change happen because we know that we need it and it's going to be better for the kids. So we try to be partners.
All right, thank you. Um, Adam Nottam, what resources are available from the Food Safety and Lodging Division of the Kansas Department of Agriculture? We have a lot of a lot of things that are out there. We're, I mean, we're really jealous of the, a lot of the stuff that schools have through KSDE's wonderful resources, but we try to add on and contribute however we can. And so one of them that we, we like to call out the five keys to food safety, we actually have this as a name badge sticker or a, uh, a name badge attachment that you can put on your name badge just to keep it handy. We have refrigerator magnets, we have quite a few of the posters. So this sort of summarizes a lot of the key points of food safety. So this is just one example. We have educational handouts on everything from boil water advisories. Oh, I don't want to jump ahead. But, uh, <laughs> well, we actually can because we only have three minutes, so. <laughs> so we have a lot of them. Uh, boil water advisories is a big one. Seems like the water pipes just keep breaking. And so helping folks re respond to those and still be able to provide safe food, hand washing, food borne illness specific sheets, cooling, all kinds of stuff, uh, template logs. We, we, if you have a question about whether we have it, just let us know. We'd love to help connect you with those resources. And it's not showing up here, but there are actually 61 handouts so far. I think we're at like 60 something now. So oh, we're, okay. We're, we're, we're adding on all the time. Yeah, I have 61 as the last look that I had. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. And Adam and Autumn, are there times when a program site must call the Food Safety and Lodging Division of the Kansas Department of Agriculture? Yeah, start with any time you have a question about it, about food safety, let us know. But specifically, we want to be a resource for you when you have any of these types of disaster situations that might come up and impact the food potentially. We should probably give our main line. <laughs> yeah, I have. Here is your contact information. It, it is nearing 3 o'clock, so I just wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to thank everybody for attending the webinar before they started closing out. And, Thank you to Adam and Autumn for joining us today on this important topic of food safety. Food safety is near and dear to my heart, so I get it. Um, so again, if you need any more information or you have questions, um, you can either contact me at the Kansas State Department of Education. You can contact Adam or Autumn at the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and they can connect you with the right resources to help you work through any kind of issues you may have. Our main line is that 6767 number. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, Adam, why isn't your phone number on there? Oh, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I want to. I tried it. calling that, actually. No <laughs> one answered today. It's only, it's only people who uh, want to get through, they'll, they'll call that. I give numbers that people will get a hold so, of. So, uh, Autumn, you can give me Adam's private line when we have an opportunity <laughs> okay. to chat again. Okay, so. School nutrition program staff have a lot at stake as they um, prepare and serve food each day. And it, when we serve healthy and nutrition meals, the nutritious meal, it really involves protecting that food from contamination because children are a highly susceptible population and are more likely to get sick from food that's contaminated. So it's important for all nutrition program team members to understand how the risks are significantly reduced when food safe practices are followed. Team members should constantly consider the consequences um, and ask themselves, what is the possible negative impact to customers, the program, and the team if I do not follow safe food practices for this activity? So do ensure that there's enough information on site, training, and monitoring to make sure that all team members achieve the same level of understanding on food safety. So make it easy to apply these food safe practices with the availability of the supplies, the equipment, the time, and the staff to get the job done safely and, and really communicate that food safety is a priority. Okay, just to, um, as a closing, we wanted to, uh, you know, at least share some of the other food safety training and other training that's out there. Um, all of this professional development protects, helps to protect the health and safety of our customers, your program, and your jobs. Um, and it does really provide you with more opportunities to further your skills and your knowledge. So do check the Kansas State Department of Education website calendar for these postings and other postings of professional development opportunities that will be available in 2019. And again, thank you for joining us today and for all you do to protect Kansas children, 
because remember their lives are in your hands. Um, and we can stay on if other people have discussion, but that is the uh, end of the webinar uh, for those who are in attendance. But if anybody has any questions or wants to type a question in the chat box for Adam and Autumn, then, then do feel free to do so. We can unmute the conference call line and see if they have any questions. Are there any questions out there while we have um, Adam and Autumn on the Skype webinar? Okay, any in the chat box? Okay. Wow, we did good. Yeah, well, we covered a lot of the hot button items that had surfaced over the course of the last six months or so. So we really feel like um, you know, the Q&A format worked really well, and I really enjoyed the interaction that we had. So I do think this is very successful, and I, I would love to do it again. Available Anybody on the line have any comments on it, if they like this format? Oh, Chris, Chris Wagner says, thank you, Adam. Yeah, I'm upset. What, what about me? Yeah. Hey, Chris. You gave an Autumn a shout out here, too. Yeah. I mean, uh... here, we, here we have uh, Janet asking, are the handouts free or downloadable? Yeah, our handouts are all free. Agriculture.ks.gov slash FSL education. So food safety logic education. Um, you can do a Google search also. But the inspector can hand it to you. I yeah. mean, contact yeah, inspector. they can also email me and I can link them to you guys because we have a link right to you guys. Perfect. Yeah, we want to cover the bases. However, it's easiest for you guys. Can you say that link again, Adam? And Sean's going to type it into the chat box. Agriculture dot what? Dot ks dot gov slash FSL education. Okay, thank you. That's good. I thought that with the interaction with the Q&A works really well, and I think it's a great way to kind of keep on top of some of the food safety violations that surface over a period of time. So even though some do repeat, I do think there's value in, in continuing on with these Q&As. I like this format. If you, Adam and Autumn, if you don't have anything else, um, I haven't seen any more questions in the chat box or any more on the conference call line, so we can close out. And thank you for meeting with us today, and then thank you for participating in, in the webinar. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for the invite. We appreciate all you guys do. Thanks. Thank you very appreciate much. you guys. And all who are on the call. Mm -hmm. On this possibly snowy day for them. Thank you.